He's just, uh, but it's well that they're expecting wonderful things. So uh, I'll pass you over to Dan and personally in, in, into, into, into what? Uh, like interview. Uh, what's that? Interview? Not interview, what's the word? Um, uh, introduce you. Introduce you. No, thank you. Thank you very Good. much. Oh, it's a Dan. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Very quiet. Hello, Dan. You're on mute. Oh, good. I'm just trying to see who I know there. Oh, um, oh Michelle, yeah, hi. Uh, who else is there? Deborah, Dennis. hello. Dennis, hello. Uh, Sue, hello. Uh, okay, no, lots of people. Okay, brilliant. Um, right, so uh, I'm here today to talk about um, something called load management or load tolerance. It's quite a, a trendy um, concept in my kind of line of work at the moment. There's lots and lots of people talking about load management, load tolerance. And you'll see why, as when I go through the talk today, why it's so trendy. Um, so before we start talking about load tolerance and what it means, um, I want to talk about injuries, first of all. Now, there are two types of injuries that we see in the clinic. The, the first type of injury we see is a traumatic injury. Now, you're all familiar with a traumatic injury. Uh, you walk in on the road, you twist your ankle, or you're on the skis and you twist your knee, uh, you have a car accident. These are what we describe as a traumatic injury. And they happen suddenly, and we know what causes them. The other type of injury that we see in the clinic, and we see this more often than the traumatic type, is the non-traumatic type. And we describe this as insidious. So an insidious injury comes about because of, of no reason that you're aware of. So you, you might wake up in the morning and you've got a stiff, sore neck or your, your knee swells up, or your knee's painful, but you can't quite work out why this has happened. So this is a bit more puzzling. You take yourself off to the doctor, the physio, and no one can really work out why this has happened. Now, the reason this has happened is, is down to the, the load management, or load tolerance, which is what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, first of all, what is load tolerance? Well, it's um, the load versus the tissue's capacity. So that we're going to talk about what the load is, and then we're going to talk about what the tissue's capacity is, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how we, we manage these concepts and how we can then prevent ourselves from having insidious onset of injury or non-traumatic injuries. Now, non-traumatic injuries often happen in the gym. They often happen during sport, so cycling, running, walking, um, and, and they're the ones, as I say, that take you to the doctor or to me without any reason why it's come on. So let's talk about load first of all. So load is the demand that we place in our body. Now, this could be the force in terms of resistance. So the resistance that you're pulling or the resistance that you're pushing or the resistance you're overcoming on your bike or in the swimming pool. Now, this is in relation to the duration of the load. So we can talk about um, how long you're loading for how many, um, how much, that much time, how much time you're running, how much time you're cycling, how long you're holding the weight up there, how many repetitions you're doing over a given amount of time. And then we can also talk about the distance. So how far you're cycling and running. Um, finally, load is determined by frequency. So we can talk about the amount of repetitions that you're doing with a particular exercise or um, the, how many sets you're doing with that particular exercise. So we talk about three sets of 15, uh, or in running, we might talk about running six laps of a field, or in cycling, it might be uh, interval training that we're doing. And then finally, we talk about frequency in terms of per week. So our load is really determined by those three things, force, resistance, um, time duration, and then frequency of exercise. Now, we're gonna park that concept for a moment and we're gonna talk about tissue capacity. Now, the tissue capacity refers to our bones, our ligaments, our muscles, our nerves, um, our soft tissues, essentially, and their ability to cope with what we ask them to do. So, our tissue's capacity comes down to a few elements. It comes down to our natural attributes. So, this is your genetics, this is how you're built. Um, it comes down to your biomechanics. Now, this is how we, how we move. So how does one person move compared to another? Now, you probably all think we move the same, but we don't. Uh, in fact, um, a good friend of mine is a forensic podiatrist. And what a forensic podiatrist does is he studies videos of people walking and running, normally running, and he stands up in court and he says, from the video footage I've seen in the CTTV, 
I can say that this person in the dock is this particular person because of the way he's moving, because of the way his foot is being placed in the ground, how his arm is swinging. And that comes down to the individual's biomechanics or movement. And you can, you can put that into anything. So you can talk about how someone lifts an object or how someone swims or how someone rides a bike. Your biomechanics are what determine how you move. Now, the other attribute to uh, tissue capacity is, is strength. How strong uh, your, your legs are, how strong your arms are. Um, this coincides with flexibility. So um, how flexible your hamstrings are or how flexible your quads are. Um, so you can see there that we've got strength, we've got flexibility, we've got biomechanics, we've got genetics. We've also got endurance. So how long you can continue to do that particular thing for, whether that is um, gardening, whether that's walking, whether that's cycling. Um, and then we've got coordination and balance. So coordination is, is your ability to coordinate your body in a efficient way. So can you stand on one leg? And whilst you're standing on one leg, can you do something else? Can you coordinate your body? You need a bit of balance for that as well. So we'll add balance into that. Um, coordination might be if you do classes. So if you're moving from, say, a press up into a jump, having the coordination to move your body in a certain way. We could be really, really specific with coordination as well. And we can say, can you do a specific movement without doing this while you do it? So for example, can you turn your head without tilting your head? Can you, uh, let's think what we can say, can you uh, just nod your head without flexing your neck? So coordination can be really specific if we want it to be. And then finally, movement choice. So having the ability to move in certain ways. So um, being able to, to do a lunge without um, dropping your pelvis, being able to rotate my body without my tummy going with me, being able to do a single knee bend. You probably can't see this from here. Being able to do a single knee bend without my knee coming in. So having the ability to coordinate my body gives me movement choice. So our tissue capacity really is determined by these things and how good we are at doing these things. And everyone's a bit different. So now if we talk about load and tissue capacity, if the load exceeds the tissue capacity, we've got a problem because the tissues are not going to like that. The tissues are going to go, oh, that's a bit, I'm a bit sore now. You've stressed and strained me. And then that stress and strain will feel to you like inflammation, which will be pain, stiffness, and therefore injury. So what we really need to try and do is make sure that we are balancing our load with our capacity in mind. So are we doing, are we doing too much of the loading or do we not have enough capacity to deal with the load that's going, going through the body? So how do we prevent injuries? Well, first of all, we're going to talk about load again. So we're going to really consider your abilities. So do you have the ability to do the given thing that you're asking your body to do? So a good example of that might be you, it's a lovely sunny day and um, you decide to go out in the garden and you decide to do eight hours of digging. Now, first of all, do, do you have the strength to do that? Do you have, you know, do you have the, the stamina to do it? Do you have the ability to do it? Um, we could consider your level as well. So if you're running, for example, and someone says to you, oh, you you're a good runner, why don't you do a marathon? Um, oh, yeah, I'll do a marathon. That's a great I can run. But are you at the level where you really can do the marathon? Is it, is, it the right, uh, is it the right level to come into running at? Um, the other thing to consider with load is, have you progressed the load gradually? So we use a rule um, called the 10% rule, which is if you're doing a sport or exercise or an activity that requires um, loading on your body, you need to be thinking about increasing the load by 10% per week. So sometimes the runners that come to us they're increasing by 25% per week because they feel really good. Um, they, they're running with a friend that runs further and the weather's nice, they've got more time in their hands. But increasing by greater than 10% per week normally means you're going to exceed your load and, and your capacity and you're gonna end up with an injury. Maybe not straight away, but further down the line. And that injury then, as, as we're talking about, you'll, you'll be, oh, I've got an Achilles problem. I don't know where that Achilles problem's come from. And it's really because you've exceeded the tissue's capacity or you've 
or you've loaded too much. And it doesn't happen straight away. It'll often happen later on when you're least expecting it and the running's going really well. Okay, other things to consider with loading is, is rest. Now, resting during the activity, so making sure you give your muscles and your tissues enough time to rest, to recover, so you can do the same activity again, whether that's lifting weights, running, cycling, uh, DIY, uh, gardening. So as the weather gets nice, I'm gonna keep referring to gardening because I know a lot of you probably do some gardening. Breaking the day down and having a rest every 40 minutes or so, giving the tissues time to recover and then carrying on again. Um, and then rest and recovery after the activity as well. So um, if you cycle, for example, if you go out for a two hour bike ride on Sunday, maybe take the Monday off and recover before you go out again and do another one. In fact, my, my watch, um, it's one of these smart sport watches. It tells me after a certain activity how long I need to recover for before I can do another activity. So if I go on a particularly long bike ride, um, it will say you need 36 hours of recovery before you do another run. So that the, um, the capacity that to So I think all of it You keep freezing. <laughs> I don't know if you know it, you're frozen. Can you hear me? Freezing, Dan. Hello. Hello. Cool. Um, that's high. I'm on a... On a um, and it would Dan, you've frozen. We can talk about weight and we can talk about reps, but as long as it's planned, we know that they're not going to come unstuck and they're not going to get symptoms that are insidious that they don't expect to get. So that kind of covers the load. Just going back to the capacity, how do we improve our capacity? How do we improve our, um, our tissue's capacity to deal with the load so we don't exceed the capacity? So the first thing is strength and conditioning. So we talked about strength and flexibility and endurance. So by doing exercises to strengthen the muscles, so for example, a runner or a cyclist, by strengthening the quads and the glutes, it's going to give those tissues a better capacity to cope with the load and the demand that is being placed on the body. Um, now you could apply this to anything. You could apply it to gardening again. You know, going out in the garden in April, if you haven't done much physical activity over the, over the winter months, um, then there's a good chance that your back isn't going to be as strong as it was back in say September when it's had four or five months of, of, of time to strengthen up. So going into the garden and digging over the garden at Easter or going and mowing a, a massive lawn in, in one go and taking three hours to do it, there's a good chance your tissues won't be ready for that. So what we could, could maybe do over a period of time is just keep the muscles strong, keep doing exercises that make those muscles stay strong in tip-top condition so that you can do the task or the activity that you want to do. So that's strength and conditioning. That's a big thing in, in, our, in our field. There's actually strength and conditioning coaches that work with physios in some clinics. But here we're quite fortunate we've got the gym, we've got the staff here, we can feed into the staff and say to the staff, can you work on this person's glute or can you work on this person's abdominals because they need that to be stronger to do the things they want to do. Variation of movement or task is important as well for tissues capacity. So not doing the same thing over and over again. For runners, I'll say to them, run different surfaces, run through the forest, run the tarmac, run the grass, run uphill, run downhill, run on canvas this way, canvas that way, because what you want to do is expose the tissues to lots of variants, because variance is good for the body. If you just do the same thing over and over again, so the same set of exercises, the body gets used to it, and you then don't get the same benefit from the exercise. So variation is key. Uh, this will definitely decrease the stress on your tissues. Okay, biomechanics we mentioned before. So here in the clinic, we do biomechanical screening. Um, and this could be anything from watching somebody um, run. So videoing someone run, slowing it down, 
analyzing their movements. We can do it for walking as well. So we can see if somebody is, um, is moving in a different way than, than we want them to. Um, so for example, runners, there's a big push in runners to try and get runners to land on their midfoot rather than their heel. So we'll do work on, on that. Um, cyclists, again, looking at the way cyclists work on the bike, but also screening their body, looking for inflexibility and weaknesses. Um, I work with swimmers, I'm a, a swimming coach as well. So um, for swimmers, they get lots of shoulder problems. Um, so we're looking at how is the shoulder working? Does it have full internal rotation? Do they have good shoulder blade control? Do they have good strength of the rotator cuff? So we can screen these parts of the body to see what uh, might come up if they overdo things or if they expose their tissues to a load that's too great and therefore exceed the capacity. Um, biomechanical screening and, and gait analysis and cycling analysis, that all ties in with optimising movement. So whilst there is not a gold standard of how to move, we know what is an optimum movement. So we know how it's best to bend your knee. So for example, if I bend my knee, if I do a squat and my knees are coming in like this, this is not optimal movement. It's likely that I'm going to get some knee pain or some hip pain at some time. What I ideally want is ideal optimal alignment. Okay. Um, shoulders again. I know that optimally people should have 60 degrees of internal rotation. I'm actually a bit stiff. 60 degrees of internal rotation because that's optimal for function. So we can look at these movements in people that are not in pain and we can say, um, you need to improve this because if you don't, there's a chance that you might get symptoms in that area. Okay, and then finally, sharing the load. So what sharing the load means is if you've got one part of the body, for example, the hip, and um, the hamstrings are doing all the work to extend the leg backwards, the hamstrings are going to get sore. They might end up becoming so sore that you can't do an exercise such as running or walking because the tendon becomes overloaded and becomes sore. Now, if we share that load, so if we ask the muscles above and below to do a bit more, in this case, the glute, so if we get the glute working better, the hamstring doesn't have to work so hard, and therefore the load is shared and the tissue capacity is not exceeded and the hamstring is happy and doesn't get painful and sore. So, what I've done there is I've tried to give you an idea on load and I've tried to give you an idea on tissue capacity. And, and, and it's those two really that make result in us becoming injured, particularly if the load exceeds the tissue's capacity to tolerate the load. Now, I'm gonna give you some examples of, um, of this in real time. I've, I've already tried to do that a little bit as I've talked. Um, good friend of mine, a uh, podiatrist called Ian, um, back in April last year, he coined the term coverload. Now, this was a combination of COVID and overload because what he and I and our colleagues were seeing was people um, having lots more time on their hand because they, they were furloughed or they were working from home. And what they were doing is, is using this time to exercise. So they were increasing their distance um, so uh, going from, say, 20 kilometres running a week up to 40 kilometres, just, just within a couple of weeks, um, and they're increasing their frequency. So um, suddenly they're going from three runs a week to five runs a week. Um, one particular guy came into me in June and said, I, my calves are really sore, really, really sore, right in the Achilles. And he had increased his mileage from exactly that, from about 20K, I think it was up to about 40 to 50K over the space of two weeks. So a massive spike in his activity level. Um, and he'd had this, these problems in his tendons. So essentially, he had exceeded his load. He, he couldn't cope. His body couldn't cope with the load he was putting through his body. Um, he should have followed the 10% rule, really. Um, with that 10% rule in mind, it's not per activity. It's over the course of a week. So really, if he's running 25 kilometers a week, he should really go up 2.5 every week in a nice, steadily, sort of progressive way. So that's one example of, of coverload, uh, as we're now calling it. Um, a second example is an example, it's not sport related, it's more work related. So this particular patient, um, she had been on maternity leave for 12 weeks and um, she'd gone back to a job. And her job was um, 
a full-time manual job working in a warehouse where she was on her feet for, uh, I think, sort of eight to nine hours a day. And she was lifting heavy objects uh, in a controlled way. She'd been taught how to lift and move. Um, but where she'd been on maternity leave for, for 12 months, um, not on her feet as much, uh, not lifting the, the same objects, lifting a baby, but not boxes, she'd become a bit deconditioned and her tissue capacity had reduced. So she went back to work. The load was the same as it was 12 months ago, but the tissue's capacity to tolerate it had reduced. And she, come, she succumbed to back pain. So she had back pain and was off work for about eight weeks. Um, so our role really was to try and um, strengthen the, the, the body, so improve the tissue's capacity, um, so that she could then go back to work, be on her feet all day long, lift, manual handle, all the things she needed to do. And, and when she was back, she was better prepared the second time around and her back pain was okay. So she didn't get, she didn't get back pain again. Um, but the, the point there is that her capacity had exceeded. Now, um, so hopefully what I've, I've given you there is, um, some of it's common sense, I know, and I think, you know, we all think, oh, I've done too much or I didn't prepare for that activity properly. Um, but I wanted to try and marry the, the concept of um, non-traumatic or insidious onset of pain and injury up with, um, with, with this kind of whole uh, system of, of, of tissue capacity and load and, and just show you how they work together. Um, so I think if any of you are getting aches and pains, what you need to be thinking about is what have I been doing the previous weeks and days leading up to my onset of pain? Have I changed something I've done? Have I changed an activity? Have I done too much? Have I exceeded my load? Have I not rested enough? Um, have I changed the way I exercise? It doesn't have to be straight away. It could have been four to six weeks beforehand and it's just built up very slowly. Um, were you up to the task? So were you up to the job that you asked your body to do? So the gardening is a big one at the moment. Have you gone in the garden and just done far too much for your body to cope with? Did you not give it enough rest and recovery? And finally, did you exceed your low tolerance? So did you just do too much again? So um, that's kind of my talk done today. Um, do you, does anyone have any comments? Now, I, Keith's not around to actually unmute you all. So um, if you have questions for me, do you want to unmute yourself and then fire the question at me? Who is that? Is that Nina? Yeah, I'm there. Hello, I can see Mine's you. not a question. Mine's just a comment. What I learned from Scott, one of your physios, because yeah. I kept getting um, ruptured calf muscles. Right. And so what I learned was that I had, I wasn't strengthening the whole of my leg muscles. So the ones above and below, and the whole leg wasn't. So, that, so going to the gym and doing the exercises that he'd given me, so far, I haven't had it again, and I'm, I'm hoping that I won't because I'll keep doing those for life now. That's, that's a really good example of sharing the load. So you're, you're strengthening all the muscles above and below to share the load through that chain. So we call that the chain. Um, and you're improving your tissue's capacity to cope with the demand you're asking it to do, which is brilliant. So that's exactly what I've just talked about. It's a fantastic example. Thank you. I was we just often wondering, oh, go on after you. <laughs> uh, who's, I answered the names. Is it Deborah? Is De it? Deborah, De Deborah, Deborah. Find in the gym. Go on, Deborah, you go first. Oh, too kind. Uh, I just wondered if you'd um, seen many people post COVID and uh, that might have been uh, suffering from deconditioning and then getting injured. Uh, to be honest with you, no. Um, not really, Deborah, no. I mean, um, uh, everyone that's had COVID that we've worked with have, have fortunately only been ill for a week or two. Um, most of them, most of them have, have got back to sport and exercise a bit slower, but just because of time, really. But no, no one's really had any after effects of COVID in the patients we've seen. No, okay. Including myself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I think everybody to, to bear in mind is, uh, like someone starting exercise for the first time, we've often, all of us have been perhaps less active during lockdown. So when we go back to exercise, it's about progression every week, doing a little bit more, like you said, that 10% is a very good factor because 
you typically get someone come in and say, well, I always used to do 5K on the treadmill at 10 kilometers an hour. So I'm just going to jump straight back on and go for it again. And then like yeah. I said, a couple of days later, they're realizing that their body's now deconditioned and they've got an injury, which then holds them up. So small stepping stones each day will gradually lead to quite a big improvement, even as much as a month, six weeks, rather than set yourself back by trying to do too much and get right back to where you were immediately. Totally agree, Colin. What you could maybe do is you could look at where you were at last year and then drop it down to sort of 60 70 percent of where you're at and start at that point so if you're running you know if you're running 10k you drop it down well running is different because you if you haven't run at all for 12 months you probably want to do something like the cash to 5k to get back into it but if you've done some exercise but not as much as last year just maybe reduce it to sort of 70 percent so with weights for example that's a good example there if you're used to doing 10k uh, bicep curls, drop it down to six or seven and work on that for a few weeks and then gradually build back up to 10 over those sort of six to eight weeks. So you give your tissues time to adjust and accommodate because otherwise you're right. What will happen is you know, people start to get niggles and aches and pains and that's frustrating because you're just getting back into the swing of things and you've even got to stop again. Yeah, we've done very different workouts with the, the, the live Zoom sessions that we've done for people in their own homes. They haven't been lifting heavier weights like they might have done on the gym equipment, but they've still done a very good workout, but it's been a very different workout. So those load capacities have changed. Yes, definitely. And I think that what's good about what you've been doing is the variance has been different. So, um, and I think that, you know, it's great because it's, it's kept your body conditioned, um, but mainly for the things you've been doing. So if you're coming back into a gym environment and you then start to throw weights around, um, that's where things could come unstuck a little bit. So, but I think I think it's good that you've all kept going because it's giving you that base to, to then spring forward from. Worst case scenario is just stopping and not doing anything and then coming back in and just trying to carry on where you were before. Dan, if you have a joint condition such as arthritis, how do you know um, if you are overloading the joints? You know, where have we, yeah, <laughs> how do you know what? how much to overload them obviously you've got to keep them um mobile and obviously increase strength in the muscles but um the joints themselves i think the first thing to say about that is that if you've got arthritis contrary to the old belief that you shouldn't do exercise for it exercise is the best thing for it exercise strengthens the muscles around the joint it supports the joint you also get long-term changes within the actual bone structure and the cartilage that they actually get harder and stronger. So uh, what we know from runners that, that do lots of long distance running, their bone structure and their cartilage and even their ligaments are thicker and stronger than, than the next person. So the old concept of you know, running wears your joints out, it's just not true. It actually strengthens the joints. So if we fit that in his head and say, well, I've got arthritic, arthritic knees or arthritic hips, should I avoid exercise? Definitely not. It should be something that's, that's, that's done. I think it's where you start, really, Michelle. So um, you have to listen to what your body says. So I always talk about pain scales. So if the pain is more than, a, say, two or three out of ten, then it's probably too much for the, for the body part. So if we're rehabbing tendons, we always talk to patients about listening to the body. If it's, if it's a three or four, that's just a bit too high. And I think with um, joint pain, it's very similar. So ones and twos out of tens, okay. Have a, look, have, a, have a look at how it feels the next day as well. So if you wake up the next morning and you think, oh, that's a bit sore still, it probably means you've done too much. If the soreness is there for half an hour after, then goes off quickly, so in my mind, that's fine. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Yes, thank you. So, so, so I think to sum, summarise there, so steadily build up. Um, give yourself lots of recovery and rest so the tissues have time to, to, to get over the exercise. Listen to how it is when you're doing the exercise. So I'm pointing to my knee because, you know, I'm just thinking of an arthritic knee. How does it feel while I'm doing the exercise? Does it feel like I can cope with this, the load that I'm putting through it? Is there any pain? If, is the pain a one or two? If it is, I'm okay with that. And then later that day and the next day, how does it feel? If there's pain for 24 hours, that's way too much. You've aggravated. You've got to decrease the load. If the pain goes off within half an hour, absolutely fine with that. We often get told, Dan, in the, in the gym that big muscles can take up to 72 hours to recover. You're all about your smart watch. And I know when I train in the gym, I get that delayed onset of muscle soreness. It's usually 24 hours later when you feel the chest muscles tightening up or your hamstrings or your quads. 
because of the activity you did 24 hours earlier in the gym or, or wherever. So how does that tie in with what, what you say is an acceptable uh, threshold? Uh, so delayed onset of muscle soreness, there's, there's a few factors in there. First of all, is a chemical reaction, so lactic acid that remains in the muscle that makes the muscle feel tight. Uh, there's also the micro trauma that happens. So when you're building muscles, what you're actually doing is causing some breakdown of the existing muscles that repair themselves and get stronger and get bigger. So I think if you're lifting between body area, so if you're doing, say, bicep curls, I probably wouldn't do bicep curls Monday and Tuesday. I'd do biceps Monday and maybe Thursday. And in between, I'd do the opposite side, triceps, just so you give them a chance to recover and repair and replenish. Then obviously, you need to think about um, the, foods and, the foods and drinks that you, you eat. So I think Luke's talked to everyone about juicing today um, as a way of replenishing the, the, the minerals and vitamins that you need to repair tissue. Obviously, protein is really important as well for, for muscle repair. So... Um, Food, drink, recovery, really important. Oh, Dan, Thank another you. question. What about stretching? Ooh, How I, was much? Hoping, I was hoping someone would ask that. Um, right, I'm going to be really contentious here. Um, all the research into stretching shows there is absolutely zero value in static stretching before or after exercise. Doesn't make any difference to performance or to injury. In fact, static stretching before exercise actually reduces performance. So what they've looked at is athletes and they've said, well, do loads of static stretches, now do the heaviest lift you can do or the fastest run you can do. And they've found that static stretching actually can decrease that performance output, which goes against everything you've been taught in the past. So what do we do instead? You need to do dynamic stretching. So it needs to be something that warms the body up. It's not like a static hold, like touching your toes or even doing this kind of thing. It needs to be things that get your arms moving, get your body moving. So it raises the heart rate. Just limbo. Um, that's much more effective than the Are we frozen? Less unless they want to lengthen something. So this is the only time that stretching is, is, is useful. If someone comes in and I find they've got restricted hip flexors or restricted quads or hamstrings, it is really tight. I will then give them static stretching to do at home in a controlled way on a regular daily basis. Because unless you stretch daily, it doesn't make any difference to the muscles. It doesn't make any difference to the muscle length because the muscle has to have that input on a daily basis to be told to get longer. So um, a good example of people that are flexible, dancers and gymnasts, they stretch all the time, every day they're stretching and therefore they make their, their muscles and their joints to some extent much more flexible because they're doing it all the time. Doing stretches in the gym twice a week won't change your flexibility. It won't be enough and it won't really prepare you for exercise either. So. If I was coming to the gym, what I would do is go on the treadmill or the bike, I'd get my heart raised up. I would then probably do some stuff in my arms, throw my arms around a bit, do some, some, some of this kind of stuff, some you know, movements like this, just really get my tissues warmed up rather than wasting my time with stretches. Unless I want to make a difference in my muscle length, then I would do stuff at home where I spend 10 minutes working on a specific muscle to make it longer. But I've got to keep that going for a long term to get the length I need. And the reason for that is that muscles have, um, they're, like, they're like chains and they have links in them. And these links are called sarcomeres. And if you imagine a muscle that's this long, it's got say a hundred sarcomeres, a hundred links in it. In order to get it longer, I've got to add links to it. So I've got to grow more sarcomeres. And the only way I can do that is start to tell the muscle I want it to be this long. So it then adds in sarcomeres and makes itself longer over time. So it has to actually grow longer. It doesn't stretch like a piece of elastic band it actually has to grow. So it has to be stimulated to do that. So there's another school of thought that actually says that you're only really gonna make a muscle longer if you, if you um, stretch it under load. So you actually make it work in a stretch position. So you put resistance on that muscle under stretch and therefore the muscle adapts and becomes longer as a result. Conversely, if you wanna shorten a muscle, what you have to do is keep that muscle in a shortened position for a long time. So if you think about a bodybuilder who's got big biceps, 
they tend to be a bit like this when they walk because they've got shortened muscles because they spent so much time doing this kind of thing that they can't no longer stretch straighten their arms because they're so short. But they've spent a long time asking those, those muscle units to lose a few sarcomeres and to get shorter and tighter. So that's quite controversial, I know, um, but it's what the research says. What would you recommend to do at the end of a workout after the, the training session at the gym? Would you do some dynamic stretching then instead of static? Personally speaking, I probably wouldn't do any stretching. I'd just cool down. I'd just lower my heart rate. I'd go on the bike and do some five, 10 minutes of lower heart rate stuff or go for a brisk walk. Um, all I'm trying to do at the end of a workout really is to um, flush out the metabolites, the lactic acid and stuff from a workout. Um, if you are going to do some stretching, a cool down a description, then I'll probably do something that's dynamic again, something that you're, you're moving with your stretches rather than static. Per personally speaking, that's what I do. Again, Colin, what, this is just from the research that's shown that static stretching after exercise has no effect on injury levels. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. If you're looking to stretch before or after exercise to stop yourself from getting injured, don't bother. If you're looking to improve your flexibility, then incorporate some stretches after exercise, but do them every day as well. So do them at home every day. So that you're, you're telling your muscles, that's what I want you to be like. I want the hamstring to be longer. Or I want the quad to be longer. Well, a lot of us have spent more time sat down um, in the lockdowns, doing work from home on the laptop. And, and then obviously everything from the waist down is in a shortened position. So we're naturally going to be stiffer now, perhaps than we would normally be because we're, we're doing less activity. Yeah, and I think um, to use that example, it's a great example, is that what happens is that hamstrings from here to here get really short because they're in a shortened position. And the glutes here, they get really long. So there's an imbalance that's formed there. You want, you want to have a nice optimum length of both. Um, triathletes that are traditionally cyclists have problems when they transition from just cycling to, to triathlons because... They, they're used to sitting on a bike with their glutes functioning here. Okay, but when they then want to run, they want their, their glutes want to function here, so that last part. And what you often find is their, their glutes are strong here, but poor here. So they start to get problems in their hamstrings, start to get problems in their back, because their glutes just can't work in this new position that they're asking it to work in. So this comes down to... Um, to tissue capacity again this comes down to looking at mechanics it comes down to look at strength and flexibility and making sure that that we give that triathlete that was a cyclist and now wants to cycle and run better glutes strong glutes that work not just here on the bike but they work here as well and there are other examples that you could use in sort of other sports but that's the best one that i tend to use thank you um, um Hi, so i actually have I have um, probably an arthritic knee and um, I've got to have it scanned, but the chances are I'm going to have to have some sort of procedure done on it, uh, maybe even a new knee, I don't know. But it's already in a sort of 20% bent position. So therefore um, I can't stretch my, um, my calf muscle properly up to the top. I can only do the lower calf and, yeah. and also my hamstrings. So will I ever get my leg straight again, whatever I have done? Is it possible to do that? And should I be doing something now? Uh, yeah, good question again. Um, <laughs> so what you've got is, is called a fixed flexion deformity. Um, and what happens is where the knee becomes arthritic and it starts to stiffen up, you start to lose elasticity. Uh, in the in the connected tissues of the fascia that surrounds it and the and the and the, and the, uh, the capsule that surrounds the joint, um, and the problem with this is when they replace the knee, they put you a, a lovely new joint in that's nice and shiny and and has not got any arthritis, but they can't change the length of the of the soft tissue around the joint. It, it, it's adapted to that sort of that length and that tension, so. The first thing is you need to try and work really, really, really hard to try and make that or keep that as mobile as you can because you don't want it to get any worse because the, the, the worse it gets, the, the poorer the outcome after your knee surgery. Um, so I would be doing lots of stuff like uh, knee hangs. So you've got your foot on something and you let your knee hang down just to try and stretch the tissue as much as you can. Um, 
And then when you do have your knee replacement, you have to work really, really hard again to try and get as much movement out of that knee as you can. Um, but adaptive shortening in fascia is really hard to change because mm. it just is. It is. So um, it's a tough one, Sue. So I think, I mean, maybe we can chat another time and just I can just show you some other things you can do for it. Um, but I think don't be, um, don't be frightened to have a knee replacement. Um, don't keep putting it off because the longer you put it off, the tighter the knee gets and then the less the favourable outcome you get from the, the joint replacement. Okay, thank you. It's the same with hip replacements as well. Um, you know, if I've got a patient at the moment and he's got um, a, quite an arthritic hip and he he's walking with his foot turned out. So uh, you can see me again. He's got his foot turned out and he's, he's sort of like this. And he can't get his leg into internal rotation. He can't get it up here. And he's a skier. He wants to go back to skiing. And, uh, but he can't have his hip replacement because the NHS aren't doing the operations. Um, they aren't doing it privately either. Um, and my concern is that he's been functioning this hip like this for so long over the last 12 months. What kind of recovery is he going to have? Is he going to get his range of movement back? Is he going to be able to extend his hip behind him and bring his knee into this position? Because he needs to get into that position to ski. Um, so I've been doing some work with him to just try and give him some increased range of movement in that joint so that when he has a replacement, it, he's got a way forward with it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Hi, Dan. Hello. Who's that? Hi, Dan. Um, Anne here. I'm. Hi, Dan. Hello, Anne. My name's Anne. Hello, Anne. Um, I've been. I am. Um, hi there. I work in an office of a home at the moment, so I spend probably a good eight hours a day sitting at a desk or a What's table. Um, so I've got all the usual sort of neck issues shoulder issues huh? yeah. and um, do you have any recommendations yeah. of some um, shoulder and neck um, exercises? Yeah, yeah, I think Keith's, Keith's talking over us. Okay, can you mute yourself? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Why that? <clears throat> uh, so shoulder and neck, did you say? Yes. Okay. Because I, I mean, think at a desk now. The first thing is, what's the desk like? So when someone comes into us, um, you can do all the exercises, you can do all the hands-on, but if they're sitting at a, um, a workstation that's not suitable for the job they're doing, then they're, they're going to have problems. Um, and, that, and, and so that's where I always start. So first of all, is the monitor, is the monitor in front? Is the monitor in front of you? Is it the right height? Uh, can you, is it at arm's distance? So can you touch it with your hand? Uh, is the top of the casing here? Um, if the screen's in the right place, um, do you have a chair that's got chair arms? Because chair arms are really important. They support the shoulder. So if you don't have chair arms, what tends to happen over the day is your shoulders sink lower and lower and you get stretching through here and that then upsets the neck. So having a chair with adjustable chair arms um, with an adjustable back that you can get yourself in a good position. Um, having the keyboard here at the start of the desk rather than here so you're not reaching forward onto it. Uh, avoiding this position. Uh, lots, of zoom, lots of Zoom calls, we sit there looking at the Zoom, the, the camera like this. So just making sure you're not sticking your chin out and that you're in this position. If you think about what the human body is designed to function like, it's supposed to be like this. Um, but when we sit down, we, we do that. And if you do that for too long, it starts to give you problems. So that is where I probably start. A lot of home working over the last 12 months has brought a lot of work into us, actually. Um, Lots of shoulder and neck, lots of headaches, lots of migraines. Um, and I think it's just going to get worse over the next 12 to 18 months because I think most people are going to continue to work from home. Um, and a lot of people, I've got people working on their beds. They've got their, they've got their tray and they've got their laptop and they're sitting on their beds with pillows behind their backs. You know, you just wouldn't do that in, the, in an office. It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be legal for one. Um, so that's the first thing. So what you can do if you want, you, if, you're, if you're patient of ours, we... we, we get patients to send photos in of their workstation with them at it. So from behind them on the sign, and then we can critique that and give them an idea of what they need to do to optimize that, send them some recommendations in terms of products that they can buy through Amazon and places like that. Um, as for exercises, um, first of all, upper body exercises are good. So just doing exercises with your arms is good. So things like shoulder, shoulder pressing is good because it strengthens your upper traps stuff where you're on all fours and you lift your arms out to the side is quite good. 
um, making sure that your alignment is good. So when you're doing these type of exercises, you're not in your forward posture, you're in a good position. So if I'm here, I'm on all fours and I'm doing that, not allowing the head to drop. Um, we can get a lot more specific um, with these exercises, Anne, but that really comes down to what the individual's got a problem with. So for example, uh, if you're getting headaches, generally speaking, it's the upper neck. It's the upper neck that causes the problem. And that's normally because the person is either sitting in chin poke or they're sitting, looking down at a keyboard, looking to the left or looking to the right, and they're kind of pivoting at the top of their head. And their typical headache pattern will be in the back of the neck, across here, maybe up here, maybe in the temples or across the forehead. So that could be an upper neck problem. A mid neck problem tends to be sort of pain from the mid neck down into the shoulder. Okay, sometimes down into the arm, pins and needles, paresthesia, that kind of thing. And then low neck problems tend to sort of radiate down the spine a bit more or sometimes just around that bump that people have got in their neck here. And if you've got problems with the mid neck, it's often because of hinging again, hanging down, hinging. The mid neck tends to be from extension. So sitting at a laptop or sitting in a position where your head's in extension. So depending on where your symptoms are, determines the exercise you get. So if it's the upper neck, we need to improve the control of the upper neck joints doing specific exercises. If it's the mid neck and it's because of this, we need to get the deep flexors at the front working and we need to get the person being able to control their movements in a better way. If it's low neck, there's a chance the shoulder might be involved. So it might be that if you look at yourself in the mirror, you might find one shoulder is a bit lower than the other, and that can drag on the neck and cause problems. So we want to strengthen through the shoulder to keep the shoulder blade up. Um, it might be a mouse hand. So I've got a lady at the moment that came to me. She's got a shoulder like that, and she's, I've got pain here. Four years, she said. I said, well, you've seen your shoulders drop from that side. And she went, oh, yeah. So we've done lots of work on these muscles in here. Got her to sit at her desk like this, not with her mouse out like that, reaching there. So it's quite complex when you're treating something like a neck and shoulder problem. There's lots of components that go into it. But hopefully you've got some ideas here, Anne, of what to look at. Yeah, I think I need to come and see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't just come see me. I've got a really, really good team. I've got, there's Renee, who's, who's here. There's um, Alina, and we've got Andrew joining us soon. All the staff at Sports and Spinal Physio, um, I interview and vet myself. They've got, they've got to jump through lots of hoops to join us. Um, they're all really experienced. They've all got um, at least five years MSK experience. So they've worked with necks and backs and sports injuries. They've also got a, a, a preference for spinal stuff as well. So a lot of physios shy away from spinal stuff. They don't like it. Um, so all our staff have got, a, they enjoy treating necks and backs. So, um, Good to know. so don't, just, don't just come to me because... Yeah, so, so they're, they're, they're all great. They're all really good. Thank you. Um, I had a knee replacement some two years ago, and I still yep. can't put pressure on it going downstairs. Okay. And what's the doctor say? He says there's nothing wrong with the knee with x-rays and everything like that. Okay. Well, um, where's the pain? Is. is it in the front of the knee, or is it in the back or the side? or Side. The outside. On the outside? Mm. Okay. Um, depends on how it's loading. So um, obviously I, I can't see your knee. So no. um, the, knee, the, knee is, the knee is essentially a hinge joint, isn't it? So yeah. um, sometimes if, if there's a little bit of an angle on the knee, it might load more on one side than the other side. So depends how it's loading um, and depends how you're, when you bend and straighten it, on ha what happens. So again, I'll try and show this to you. If you go up the stairs and your knee does that or does that, that would change the forces acting on the knee. So it may well be that the knee's good, but the thigh and the hip muscles around here aren't strong enough and they're not allowing the knee to track in the right position. So the biomechanics are out. That, that could be one reason. Um, it, could be, it could be some scar tissue that's been irritated. Um, what else could it be? Let's think. Um, I mean, I'd always go with strength and I'd always strengthen around the hip for me. So the, the knee's really just a hinge joint. It just gets caught in the crossfire between the foot and the hip. So the hip is multi-directional in, out. So it can do a lot of stuff. The foot's the same. And then the knee's in the middle and, and wherever the hip and the foot go, the knee goes with it. So I'd look at this and I'd look at your foot as well and see what that's doing. That would be yeah. my take on it. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else?
Dan, can I just ask a couple of things? One thing. Yeah, of course you can. I'm in the room next door now. <laughs> it's, it's in your room. You're next door, but you're on there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, role reversal. Um, I just want to reiterate what Dan said, um, is that I think he's probably, I think you'd probably agree with this, he's probably got his best ever team of physios, as far as my opinion, um, he's ever had. Um, and I think, um, you know, if you're looking for treatments, I know Dan is incredibly busy, um, but you know, the team he's got now are exceptional. Um, and so I wouldn't hesitate to choose one of the other physiotherapists if Dan's not available. Um, but what would you say to everyone, for those that don't really know you that well, um, are the, the, the right route? Um, I know you used to do like discovery calls. Um, I don't know if you have the time now, to be fair, to do free discovery calls. But I know you do a treatment um, splash assessment, um, a special one-off rate for Morton's members. And I'm not after prices now. I'm just saying the concept of it. What would be the first step for someone who's not sure what they need treatment? Would it be to come along for that one-hour assessment um, to then see what the next course of action is, and what, what would you, how would you guide them? Uh, is the first step to um, looking into something just to see if they can get on top of it? Uh, yeah, so we still do. We're doing the free fifteen-minute sessions. So we were doing them face to face, but we're now doing them predominantly over the phone. Um, if someone really wants a video call, we'll do a video call for fifteen minutes. But sometimes it's easy to just do it over the phone, and these are great because what it allows you to do is to pick our brains. Uh, and to see whether we think it's something we can help you with. Um, and then also whether you want to work with us. Um, so we'll normally go over what, what's the problem, what's it stopping you from doing, uh, where do you want to get to, what have you tried so far? Um, and then it'd be a case of, right, okay, I think we can help you, or maybe we need to get this done before you come in to see us, and maybe you need to get a scan, or maybe you need to go and see a consultant to, to get a bit of information before we see you. So those are the free 15-minute ones. And the best way to do that is to just to book it either online or ring up the, the booking team that are off-site and ask them to if they can, you can book a free discovery call. And yeah. if you book that with either Alina or me or Renee, but you can all do that. Uh, um, and then obviously, the, 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 the first step for us is to bring the person an assessment. So the, an assessment is essentially an opportunity for us to get um, a really clear idea on what you are aiming for. So as a patient, what's your ultimate goal? What do you want to get back to or what do you want to be able to do that you, you currently can't do? Um, what's your expectations for this session today? So what do you want to get out of today's session, which is normally a bit of a roadmap as to how you get where you need to get to. Um, and then the assessment is really in three stages. It's the first bit of talking where we asking you, where's the pain? What does it stop you doing? Um, what have you tried? What haven't you tried? What medication are you on? What's your past medical history? What's your occupation? What's your sports, etc. Then the next bit is the examination where we're looking to test the body part to see whether we can tell you, hey, what's wrong with it? Or what's the muscles like around it? What's the movement like? What's your control, your coordination like? What's your endurance of those muscles? All the things we talked about in tissue capacity. And then the last part of our assessment is a 15 minutes really where we're planning. Now, um, I, I think some patients get a bit frustrated with this part, but unless we can spend 10 to 15 minutes at the end of it and actually go through a plan with the patient, it's really hard for them to actually know where we're going to go with it. So the plan will be a case of talking about the diagnosis, um, talking of reaffirming the goals just to make sure we're aligned with the patient, um, talking about the barriers that are there that we've got to overcome to reach those goals. So that could be anything from changing your workstation to improving the strength, uh, to having an injection, convenient, couldn't it? And then after we've done that, we can then talk about the types of treatment we might need to do. So, you know, strengthening, hands-on, um, workstation stuff again, gait analysis. Um, and then we can talk about the phases of getting someone better. So phase one, week zero to four, we will require you to come in X amount of times because we need to do this, 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 and this. Phase two, we're going to see a little bit less frequently because you buy then you're doing a bit better. You know what you need to do exercise-wise. You've got your workstation set up. And then the last phase normally is that kind of end stage and late stage phase of, of treatment where the patient's doing really well and they're only coming in either like two weeks or every, every month. So I've got a few patients that I see. I've got patients I see quarterly. I've got patients I see monthly. Um, and I've got some long-term patients that I see kind of every two weeks, but I try not to because I want them to be independent and, and self-sufficient. So, so that's kind of how the assessment works. Um, in terms of treatment, Keith, I'll just tell you about that. So once you've had your assessment, you'll come in and uh, you will we'll have a quick catch-up. Uh, the sessions are quite quick, so they're half an hour. So um, I try not to talk too much. 
Um, and it's down to business. So it's like, how did your exercises go? Show me them. Brilliant. Let's do this. Or that's not so good. Let's do this instead. Uh, maybe some hands on to get things loosened up. So it might be that we move the joints and loosen those up or that you know, it's the knee joint, stretch the knee joint. But the reason for doing the hands on really is to make the exercise more doable. Because if you can't do the exercise correctly because you've got stiffness somewhere, then you're not going to get anything out of the exercise. And the purpose of the exercise is to try and improve your movement, your coordination, your strength so that your joint or tissue is happier. And then at the end of that session, we send our patients home with um, a link with some videos of their exercise. So everything we try and do is on, on it's digital. So you get your exercises sent out. And some of my patients will know that. So um, Michelle, you know that. Dennis, you know that. Sue, you, you'll probably know that as well. Um, Deborah, you, you know definitely. So we send out exercises as video attachments that you can watch the exercises and do them at home. And we expect our patients to be compliant and do what they need to do because otherwise they'll probably come and see us. Um, you know, you won't get much out of it. We don't get anything out of it. It's frustrating for us as clinicians. Someone comes in and says, oh, no, I didn't do my exercise this week. I was too busy. Well, okay, well, do you want to get this better or not? So that's really how the process works. Okay, thank you. Now, I think, I think the, the, my story and how we first got to know each other many, many moons ago um, was, uh, I think, a, a common story. My, my, I'd been to various other therapists um, and I suppose was put to uh, it's going to take you like 20 sessions etc and then, then it becomes a monetary concern um what impressed me most about yourself was two things one is you're the only person that within one session made a massive pain relief for my problem and no one had done that and operations were being talked about and secondly is that um you gave me a roadmap it was a a, a, a small number of sessions um and then phased it out and you had no there was no way you were trying to um, push me any more sessions out of me for commercial gain. And whilst we're all running businesses here, that's what impressed me most about you and the feedback I get. So I think people don't need to be concerned about, I'm going to end up um, being committed to 100 million sessions. You, you're so busy anyway, with great respect, that you only, it is what it is, isn't it? And people don't give it enough time, but they also think it's going to take a lot longer than it really does if they do it properly. Yeah. I think, I think it's important to be honest and upfront with patients and tell them that it's going to take X amount of time. Um, yeah. I think that surprises some patients. They, they think that their, their back pain they've had for four months is going to go away in three sessions in, in two weeks. Yeah. Um, tissues take a while to get better. Um, I think it's really important. One of, one of our core values as a business is to empower. So uh, to empower our patients with our knowledge and skills and expertise so that they can go away and manage their own problem help, yeah. help them stay better and stay better. Because um, I, I don't really, I don't, I don't, I don't mind having patients long term, but I don't want patients on time. I want them to get better and not need me. Um, that's, yeah. that's the end goal. Um, I, I mean, I've got a, a few patients. I've, there's about half the patients I can think of that come in, uh, have been coming to see me for years, and they come in for a loosen up and a chat, to be honest with you. That, yeah. you know, and that's, that's, the, the, that's it. Um, I, yeah. I discharged someone today, and we did a video a testimonial. And so Matt came to see me uh, last year. I think it was uh, July time. And we started these sessions over Zoom because we were in lockdown. And... Um, he had headaches, he had neck pain, he had shoulder pain, and um, he's done really well. And he came in today, and it's, it's, I think I saw him about four weeks ago, and four weeks ago he was good, and he came in today, and he was good again. I said, I don't need to see you, Matt. You know, you're, you're coming in to see me, but you, you're better. So we both, he said, oh, yeah, no, but I, I want to see you. What about my neck? I said, you're fine. You don't need me. So, uh, yeah. you know, that's a lovely, lovely position to get into with a patient where they, they, they want to come and see you, but they don't really need to come and see you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh... So I think, I think uh, so a lot of people, I think, live with, as I was, I live with niggles that really are so treatable if they just stopped, went and had them looked at, and then maybe did a, a short course of treatments and then learn specifically what they need to be doing. And most people, well, I say most people would do it. Most sensible people would then take on board what you're saying and do at least a version of it regularly. And the problem is manageable suddenly. So I think people live with problems too much when they could just stop and just say look let's go and spend a bit of time and a small amount of money and just go and get on top of this and if they did they'd be so much happier yeah, agree, agree. Uh, you know, uh, michelle do you want to say something i did actually um it's just um, an observation um because over the years i've had um, my share of problems um and the the medics or the gps or the consultants you go to um are just too quick for surgery or other intervention, and they don't think so much. I've had to actually particularly ask, well, what about a physio? That, oh, well, yeah, you can try it, but 
they, it doesn't seem to be like the lady that was talking about her knee. Have they addressed, as you were saying, the, the fascia, the muscles around it, and, and they're probably not telling her to strengthen the muscles prior to surgery. And it just amazes me in this day and age and the advances we've made with, with medicine that it's still just straight for the surgery or injection for the pain and not actually managing the biomechanics, as you were mentioning. I think there's a few problems there. I think the first problem is money. Um, I think the NHS physios are really, they really struggle because you only get sort of a few sessions with the NHS physios. At the moment, it's all virtual, which personally I think isn't, as, isn't very good. It's, you know, I've done virtual myself and it, it's frustrating. You can't do what you need to do with patients. Um, <laughs> I think there's, there's a lack of, lack of skills and expertise in, in some physios as well. Um, you know, some, some lack that experience. Um, so patients don't get better. So they go back to the GP and the GP says, oh, well, physio hasn't worked. And it's not because the physio hasn't worked. It's because the, the physio wasn't the right physio or the, or the patient. Maybe the patient didn't do what was asked for them. That's the other thing as well. So quite a lot of patients will go and see a physio and they just won't do the recommended exercises. And they go back to the consultant and the consultant goes, oh, it hasn't worked. And I think then they think, well, physio won't work for that again. So they, they start to become, uh, they think that's the normal. So I think there's a lot of different factors involved in that, Michelle. Um, um, and I think also um, exercise is so undervalued, so undervalued. And there's a, there's a lot of people that go and see osteos and chiropractors and, and they're very what we call passive treatments, very much lay down, let me do this to you, this is going to make you better. Now, a lot of passive treatments help, they get people feeling better and a lot of people swear by them. But in my own opinion, um, and the research supports this, is that the long-term effects of passive intervention isn't that great. Uh, it, you, you still get lots of recurrence with injury if you have passive intervention. Uh, it's nice to have a massage, and we do massage here. It's a nice well-being uh, treatment. Um, but massage is not going to fix an arthritic back or an arthritic neck. Um, what's going to make that neck feel better is moving correctly, exercising it correctly, strengthening it, uh, improving the external factors such as the workstation and the way that the person is exercising. And I think sometimes those things, you don't have enough time to do that on the NHS. And some of the physios don't have the expertise to do that in the NHS as well. So I think there, there's lots of factors involved in that. And I, I don't get everyone better either, Michelle. You know, so, you know there, there's a limit to what we can do. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Keith's got, Keith's got his coat and he wants to go home. I'm just cold. <laughs> it's cold. It's really it's cold, cold in here. It's, it's not I'm moving around. I'm <laughs> all done. Yeah, and one, one final thing. When you're in the gym, also you've got the ability to train muscles through lots of different ranges of movements, which is great. Uh, and we always get told to train the biggest range we can because at the extremities of each movement with each muscle is where potentially you are weakest because of the, of the fulcrum and so forth. Um, can you give us any advice about so resistance training and, and, and linking that? Uh, yeah, um, I mean I'm I'm quite careful when I when I load extremes of range, even myself, um, because that's where you're vulnerable. So if you're doing say a fly and you're right back here and you're, you're laying your back on a bench, the shoulder joint is vulnerable because the load is so far away from the joint and therefore the joint stress is greatest. So I think um, if you're training extremes, be careful. Um, I, I avoid the last 10%, 15% of a range just so that I don't put myself into that position. Um, I don't think that has a negative effect on flexibility, to be honest with you. Um, uh, if you're going to train into range, build up slowly. Don't, don't go mad. So, again, a nice example today. I've got a guy with shoulder pain. I've been treating him for about five months with his shoulder pain. He's had it for four years. And... Um, he, we, we think it's a rotator cuff problem. So if, you, if it's a bunch of tendons that attach in the shoulder. So we've done lots of cuff drills and lots of strengthening with weights and bands. And I tested his cuff strength using a, a machine we've got. And we worked out his cuff strength. So his external rotation, his internal rotation, his abduction was just as strong on the painful side as it was on the non-painful side. Now he's probably about 70, 80% better. And um, when I asked him today, when do you still get pain then? He said, well, it's in certain positions. I feel a bit vulnerable. And I said, well, show me what you mean. 
And the positions was exactly that, extremes of range. So extreme here and extreme here. And because what happens in those positions is the ball and socket joint is being stretched to the front. And it's, it's potentially irritating the tissues at the front of the shoulder joint. So for him today, because we've done all the things that I normally do for a rotator cuff and his shoulder blades are all strong, I started to take him out into that. So I've, I've got him with a two kilo weight, he's laying on his back and he's actually throwing his arm, but stopping just before that vulnerable point. So he's stopping, bringing back, stopping, bringing back, stopping, bringing back, and different ranges as well. And what I'm trying to do is expose the tissues around that area to load so that they adapt, so that he increases his tissue capacity to, to cope with those extremes of range. Now, you wouldn't have done that day one because he wouldn't have come back to me. Uh, and I made him too sore. But now he's got the confidence in me and he's got the confidence in his shoulder and he knows and trusts his arm better. We can start to explore those positions where he's most vulnerable and where his pain is and hopefully get some adaptation. And in hopefully six weeks' time, I'd like to think that he can do that, throw his arm back into those positions and actually it'd be pain-free because he's developed those, that, that new tissue capacity. So I don't think that answers, Colin, but hopefully it gives you a rough idea where I'm thinking of. People say you only get strength gains in the range in which you train, but maybe that's not true. So you don't need to go to the extremity of that range in order for the muscle to be strong. I just think if yeah. you're in a spot and lifting, if you don't get squatting down low enough, then when you're right down there, you're very weak. And until you get to that little bit further up, you're not going to have the strength to kick in and lift that weight. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with that. Totally agree. So if you if you want to be able to do a task, you you're going to get safe example of the squat is a good example. If you just did a half squat, yes, you're going to get stronger in your legs, in your glutes, and your quads, but it won't probably make you stronger for the deep squat that you want to do. So to do the deep squat and be to be good at it, you've probably got to go down there and do that. But it depends on whether you want to, you need to do the deep squat or not. So for me, do I, you know, do I need to do a fly right back here? What's the value of that in my life? Nothing really. I'm quite happy doing a fly 10% short of that because that for me, I'm happier in my shoulder. My shoulder feels less strained. And I feel there's less risk with it. Uh, apply that to the cyclist as well. We want the cyclist to be, uh, sorry, the runner who is the cyclist to be stronger in their glutes in that terminal part of hip extension. They are going to have to train that glute in terminal extension. So they're going to have to do something like um, either on all fours, hip extension thrust or a glute thrust on the bridge coming into terminal extension to, to generate strength and power in that position. If they just exercised, um, I can't do it here, but if they just kind of exercised here and didn't go right back into that, they're not going to change that muscle strength in that inner range position. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, fantastic, Dan. Thank okay. you very much. I just wanted, I'll, I'll voice over it, but uh, just to let everyone know, during Dan's presentation, we crossed over the 2,000 pound fundraising hey. lot. So, oh, hey. no. It's been 2040 now and increasing. So, so I shall let Mr. James well know. We'll be delighted. And uh, thank you for everyone's support and help. And I hope you found Dan's uh, talk useful. I'm sure you did. And uh, don't forget, if you need any uh, physiotherapy help, sports and spinal here, uh, we'll definitely help you out. And uh, I can highly recommend them. Not until after Easter, though, because we've got no appointments. <laughs> no, until after Easter. You've got to be okay till then. Yeah, yeah okay. hang in there. Thank you very thank much, you, Dan. Thank you very thank much. You, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you.